having been raised by an Air Force officer and having spent four years in the United States Air Force, what this man wanted to hear. So I told him what he wanted to hear. Sir, I didn't see anything. I want to get the hell out of here real quick. Um, please, let's get this over with. That pleased him. I then was given several pieces of paper to read, which literally all said basically the same thing using different words. They were different rules, regulations, and laws governing the safeguard of information pertaining to the national security. And then I had to sign a security oath saying that I would never talk about what it was that I had just told this gentleman that I had not seen. <laughs> and then I was allowed to go. Later I was trained, I was selected and trained for Naval Security and Intelligence. I was given a secondary NEC of 9545, which is Internal Security Specialist. My job was to safeguard, control, classified information, secure perimeters, buildings, naval installations, um, detect bugging devices, all of these things. I was specifically trained to conduct Pacific Area Intelligence Briefings. And then after all this training, I was sent to Vietnam and made a patrol boat captain for Naval Security and Intelligence. I was attached to Camp Carter, which was the headquarters of Naval Intelligence and I Corps. I was then sent to a division of Naval Intelligence, which was the Da Nang Harbor Patrol. Um, I was given a crew, a patrol boat, and a lot of weapons and ammunition, and they turned me loose. And that was crazy, because I was a young man who didn't know what the hell I was doing. But I did okay, thank God. Some others didn't. Later I was transferred up to the Dong River Security Group, which was another division of Camp Carter Naval Intelligence. And my job there was to patrol the river, make friends with the people along the banks, gather intelligence, and maintain the safety and security of the river. That river was at the DMC, it's the Takan River. The base camp was Kwabia at the mouth of the river on the southern bank. Um, and it was a major supply route for supplies that went to Quezon, which was under siege. While there, I learned that there was significant UFO activity in Vietnam, a lot. Why? I don't know. Uh, there were rumors flying everywhere. Uh, we heard stories of enemy troops firing at UFOs, our side firing at UFOs, UFOs flashing back with blue lights that, that did crazy things. The same things that you hear happening today. We, I know of one instance for a fact that after UFOs hovered above a South Vietnamese village all night, the next morning there was not a living soul in that village. Don't ask me where they went because I haven't got the slightest idea. But it's incredible. We were told that any UFO information that we sent in dispatches, messages, or discussed over the radio, we were to use the code word enemy helicopter activity. And that's what we did. The enemy had no helicopters in Vietnam, period. <laughs> so anything you see in the history of Vietnam that refers to enemy helicopter activity is in fact referring <coughs> to UFO activity, unidentified flying objects. When I left Vietnam, I was sent to the USS Charles Berry DE-1035 for a short period with NIS Naval Investigative Service to conduct an investigation on board that vessel. Three months later, I left, was transferred to the staff of the Commander Chief of the United States Pacific Fleet, who at that time was Admiral Bernard Clary. And was specifically attached to his intelligence briefing team. I also stood watches. In the Navy, you have a primary job. Some people don't know this, so let me explain it. In the Navy, you have a primary job, which you do. You also have to stand additional duty, which is called watches in the Navy. My watch station was Petty Officer of the Watch in the Command Center, which meant I was the senior enlisted man in the Command Center, in charge of the Command Center and the information. I was also the designated speak out operator which meant top secret, crypto, communications that came in under a specialized, compartmentalized category. I was the only one on watch who was allowed to handle that information and direct it to the specific place
place where it was to go. Now, normally these things are handled by radio men and communications technicians in a communications center. But in a command center where they have to have information instantly, everything that goes to the communications center also comes to the command center. So that there is not a delay in important information, uh, urgent information, getting to the right people who have to make command decisions. It was there that I saw documentation that I have to tell you right now could have been shown to me or given to me or I could have been put in that position in order to see these documents so that I would specifically talk about them later. And I'll tell you why in just a few moments that that might have occurred. I don't believe that's the case. I believe that the information that I saw was real, was accurate, and is occurring. The documents stated that extraterrestrials were real, that UFOs were piloted by them and had been visiting this earth for many, many thousands of years, that there was a project called Aquarius that had researched this history and compiled the history from written human records, starting with the ancient tablets left by the Sumerians, the Assyrians, the Mesopotamians, the Egyptians, right up to modern times. These documents were quite thorough and very convincing, believe me. There was documentation that the United States had actually recovered crashed alien craft. The first one occurred near a small town called Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. The crash site actually covered two locations. One location was on a ranch belonging to a Mr. Brazel. The other location was approximately 60 miles from there where the main uh, bulk of the craft had come down from which they had removed three dead alien bodies. I saw photographs of these bodies, I saw photographs of the autopsies, and I saw photographs of the internal organs of these beings. It stated that in 1949 another crash had occurred, also in New Mexico, from which they had recovered more bodies and that they had found one live alien creature wandering in the desert. Now you have to understand, just because I saw these documents doesn't mean that all of this actually occurred. These could have been presented to me to make me believe that this had occurred. It stated that they had kept this live alien in captivity until June 2nd, 1952 at which time he died of unknown causes. They instituted a project called Sigma to attempt to contact the race that this being belonged to. Sigma evolved into the National Security Agency. That eventually contact was made, landings occurred, communication took place, an alliance was agreed upon. This actually was supposedly happened at Muroc, which is now known as Edwards Air Force Base in California, in 1954. President Eisenhower was on vacation at that time uh, in Palm Springs. During this time, you can see by reading the newspapers that he disappeared. The newspapers went crazy. Reporters were combing the, the countryside looking for the president. They were told that he had suffered a toothache and had flown by helicopter to a dentist. Well, this was not true. The true place where he was taken was Muroc, Edwards Air Force Base. The base was closed. This is also on record for three days. No one could go in, no one could come out. There are witness accounts that say three unidentified flying objects flew over Edwards Air Force Base and landed. We have a letter, which I'm going to show you later, from Mr. Gerald Light, who states that he was there when President Eisenhower was there. He saw the ships. He saw these creatures. And that's just the beginning, but I'm not going to go much farther than that right now. We're going to get into some documentation so that your disbelief can start to see that this is not as incredible as it sounds. 